Welcome back to Worth Weekly News. This week, Gaijin actually did something that I like. Creating a naval enduring confrontation game mode, as well as some bomber repair cost reductions. However, those repair cost reductions aren't all roses, as there are some pretty large thorns that come along with them. So be sure to hit the subscribe button. Let's get into it. First off, with this naval enduring confrontation, what is this all about? Honestly, I feel this is the game mode that will save naval farces from being a comedic afterthought. So, starting off, it's AB, because apparently AB has a larger player base. Any boat and airplane from 1.0 to 5.7 is allowed. However, you are required to take at least one boat that is 3.7 to 4.3. You can respawn as many times as you like. However, respawns require a SL cost. And to respawn as a ship that is 4.7 or above or an aircraft requires spawn points from about 500 to 1000 depending on the vehicle. However, it's not that hard to gain spawn points. To win the game mode, you essentially have to capture all the points or harbor and then wait for the enemy's ticket bleed to go down. There are some other objectives that randomly pop up, but they're kind of boring. And to capture a harbor or point, you essentially just need to kill all the enemies in that point and then allows you to cap it. However, enemy forces can spawn in the point as you're decapping it, which can obviously be an issue. From the description, you might be thinking this is a pretty lackluster game mode, especially it being an AB. But I say not, as this game mode is actually extremely fun and is exactly what naval forces was missing. The way guys had been doing it was to make the tank game mode with big floating tanks with lots of guns. However, when most people think of naval engagements, especially Second World War naval engagements, they don't really think about rushing out to capture strategic zones near islands. They more think of long drawn out combat with ships firing miles at each other from way off distances. And that's exactly what this game mode finally gives us. Just being able to fulfill that, I guess, fantasy made all the things I heavily dislike about naval combat totally be an afterthought as I was finally able to shoot ships that weren't like right next to me. It wasn't just a knife fight with really comedically large knives. It was a, a sword fight on a field. This is a weird analogy. The game mode was great however it wasn't without issue as there was quite a few problems that Gaijin had I would assume expected however they did nothing to prevent them. One of the biggest ones was it was extremely unbalanced because it's arcade on a big map and one of the nations Japan has the type 93 oxygen torpedoes which have I think it was 20 kilometer distance range when compared to anyone else is double so essentially any Japanese ship with these torpedoes commonly the Yodachi could just sit 20 kilometers away from an enemy spawn point and just lob torpedoes into their harbor. And while the Japanese ships already have a secondary reload, being able to carry like 16 torpedoes, opposed to 8 like most destroyers, in arcade, you automatically reload torpedoes once you're out, once you fire them all. So the Yodachi would never have to move from that position, so they just sit there the entire game and lob torpedoes. And if you went out to destroy them, because they're being a nuisance, well have fun dodging constant barrages of torpedoes as you try to get into a reasonable gun range. And once you are there, you still have to be dodging hort torpedoes the whole time, hit the enemy ship enough times to actually sink it, while only one torpedo from them will sink you. And of course, your torpedoes aren't in range yet, because they're only like 8 kilometers. Some have like 10 kilometers. So essentially, it would boil down to whoever had more Yudachis on their team would most likely win. I know it's the same issue as, since it's arcade, there's arcade flight characteristics, as well as bombers having their bombs rearm mid-flight. Wanting to take advantage of this, I did spawn in the Peb 8. However, unfortunately, there seemed to be some pretty thick cloud cover above all the enemy bases, so I couldn't really abuse it too much. Also, for some reason, the engines of the Peb 8 were actually hotter than the center of the sun. I'm assuming this is because the only way to carry Stalin's mixtape is to have an aircraft powered by four fusion reactors. Some of the other problems had to do with the game mode itself, just not having a whole lot of effort put in into it. The spawn locations seem to be really weird and messed up. I don't think you should be able to spawn in a base while it's being decapped as it would make it rather hard. However, I also think that you shouldn't be able to cap a whole harbor with a single float plane just landing there. Some coastal defense guns and some anti-air could really make attacking a harbor 
more intense. I also had a thought that perhaps maybe a player that's doing really well could use some, I don't know, maybe spawn points to spawn a convoy of allied AI ships to help them assist in attacking a harbor in case they can't get any other players to go with them. Another issue I noticed is that smaller boats had little to nothing to do. The map was the air map Saipan with none of the usual AI targets. So if you wanted to spawn in a small gunboat, you would be completely useless to your team. In the same with most other small torpedo boats. In fact, if you were anything but a Yodachi, you were kind of useless. Kind of like that the Japanese torpedoes were extremely OP because that's how it was in real life. What I think would make these gunboats not useless, put some soft AI targets on the beaches that you would have to shoot, of course. That would be really simple for them, and then they could have engagements near the beaches, but also perhaps maybe some rocks to help them hide to oncoming destroyers. But I think would be a good idea is rivers for the boats to go up, and so destroy couldn't follow them. However, this could only be implemented in certain maps as Saipan doesn't actually have any rivers on it, but generally different types of terrain for the smaller boats to stand some type of chance or have the upper ground in certain circumstances. What I'd really like to see though is if you could spawn tanks at certain points on the map. So say if, I don't know, most of the ports have been captured, you could spawn a tank and try to take the port that way. And in return, the other people could spawn tanks to defend their ports. Then we would have tanks tanks, planes, and boats all on the same map, all the same game mode. And that, I think that would like be peak War Thunder. You could just basically turn off all the servers then everybody would be satisfied. You would have to redo the entire Saipan map so it's more visually appealing to tanks as currently it looks like a PlayStation 1 Final Fantasy overworld map. So I, yeah, maybe we could wait a little bit on that. However, Gaijin, I'm not giving up, so I'm gonna push for it. We need a game mode that has tanks, planes, and boats all in one and helicopters too too, for no good reason. We'll save that for like high BR when you get any ship missiles and I don't know, nukes. So pretty much it's a really good game mode. I hope Gaijin invests a whole lot more into it as it could definitely be a star of the show. Like how people only ever talk about World of Warships, not World of Tanks anymore. Perhaps maybe people will talk about War Thunder as in a naval combat game with tanks and planes as an addition. I don't know, maybe that's a bit starry-eyed but it has a lot of potential. A lot of potential, so please do not squander it. The next story actually came out not this week as actually the, the next week because uh, I took forever to actually record this thing and then more news came out. It's not like I had anything else to make the video about though. So anyways, bomber repair costs are going down and I mean it by a lot. The uh, the big ones like the B-29 at currently at 51,000 is going down to 12,000 repair costs, which sounds amazing. It's great, man. The B-29 is actually going to be like usable. <laughs> However, there's a big old caveat to it is as the repair costs go down, so does the reward for bombing bases. Now I'm pretty sure if I read this right, you still get the same amount of RP if you happen to kill enemy aircraft. However, damage in a base is uh, much lower. For example, if you were to use the 2,500 pound bombs, the old reward was 19,764. It is now 9,542. If you notice, that's quite a heavy reduction. I'm not going to go through every single one, because even if I whittle it down to only the highest costing bombers before, they still have to go through each individual bomb load. It would take forever and would be boring. The chart will be up for you to read yourself, but I will point out the most expensive bombers on how much they have been reduced. Starting with, I already said, the B-29 went from 51,000 to 12,685. The TU-4 was reduced from 37,000 to 28,813. Same with the Chinese one. Not a very big reduction. G8N1 was reduced from 33,000 to 15,700. By the way, why is the G8N1 have such a high repair cost? Its max bomb load is nothing compared to the others. The ME264 went from 37,000 to 7,000. The HE177A5 went down from 37,000 to 5,557. The Lincoln B Mark II went down from 24,000 to 11,000. 342. The B-57A went down from 18,000 to 13,594. The Canberra B-1 Mark VI went down from 15,740 to 13,850. The Canberra B Mark II went down from 15,000 to 9,567. The B-57B went down from 14,030 to 
to 11,180. The SO450 Valtor 2A went down from 14,000 to 12,135. The Lancaster B Mark III went down from 13,940 to 6,410. The SO450 Valtor 2B went down from 13,340 to 6,640. The TU14T went down from 11,670 to 8,700. The G5N1 went from 10,750 to 7,220. 7, the P108B Series 2 went down from 10,300 to 7,160. The Lancaster B Mark 1 went down from 10,000 to 6,491. And one of my favorite bombers, the Focke-Wulf 200C1 went from 5,200 to 2,704. And the greatest and most important bomber that had a insane reduction was the F222 that went from 450 to 438. And an insane change that I'm not sure if Gaijin can afford to do such things. Now those are not all the vehicles that got repair cost reductions. Those are just the bombers that had a repair cost originally above 10,000 that had reduced. And the Focke Wolf 200 because I like that bomber. To read them all out to you would take a very long time. So I suggest you look at the chart, see if your favorite bomber got a reduction. Although you have to keep in mind that with these great reductions of repair costs, there is also a great reduction to the reward you get for bombing bases. And is this trade-off necessarily needed or worth it? Well, I can't really say. I'm not a super mathematician with all the facts that Gaijin has. I think a real solution to the issue here is actually to rework bombers' roles currently in Air RB. And on that front, I unfortunately don't really have a solution that I've thought up of yet, as it is quite a complicated task to do. And along with the bombers, strangely enough, there was actually a good amount of fighters that also had minor repair cost reductions, mainly because these fighters could carry a good number of bombs. So I guess Gaijin decided to count them as bombers. I think the greatest repair cost reduction I spotted was for the F4C Phantom II that went from 11,140 to 9,130. Not too much. Most other ones looked like the reduction to the T2, which was from 18,000 to 17,201, or the FJ4B, which went from 7,100 to 6,923. And along with those repair cost reductions, as slight as they are, they got some pretty heavy reward reductions. I'm not going to read them all because it goes for every single loadout that has bombs in them. But what I noticed on this is if you are disappointed because you're hoping to grind out all the rest of the modifications for the F4C, nowhere on this chart does it seem to speak of the rocket loadouts when I'm pretty sure you can kill a base with. Well, I would hope you could. It has a lot of rockets. Final bit of major news that happened the actual week this is being recorded, not the one that's supposed to cover because nothing actually really happened there. I had some like data mine files of some minor things I'll get into right after this was the announcement of what sounds to be a crafting event. It's tagged as news. The title reads Danger Crane Operators Overhead Passage Prohibited. I need to get a better pop filter. The sock on my microphone isn't working as well as I'd hope. And then there's the picture of the cargo ship and below it reads a huge container ship from Admiralty has docked at our port. The official handed over an envelope with a note. Prepare your production equipment by October the 3rd. So what we can deduce from that is it's a crafting event. Yay. I really hope they get rid of the RNG and don't make it last only like a week. Admiralty, according to Wikipedia, was apparently a British government department responsible for the command of the Royal Navy in the First Kingdom of England. However, it seems to have a more common definition as just a court exercising jurisdiction over all maritime cases. I'm pretty well versed in this stuff because I commonly have to fight off road pirates while I am traveling in my land vessel. I have a feeling that all this Armady stuff, we're not going to see necessarily anything British. Maybe, well, there's a possibility, but I don't think this directly has anything to do with it. Maybe some ships. What I think is more important is when this happens, October 3rd, which is the German Unification Day. So you would expect something German. A lot of people have been saying, oh, I bet it's going to be the Sturm Tiger. There is little to no evidence about the Sturm Tiger. I think there was a file for a gun of its caliber found oh, years ago. Besides that, uh, They've denied it multiple times, I think. So do not expect the Sturm Tiger. What I would expect is the mouse. Because Gaijin said that they would be available for events. Um, they did also say that it wouldn't be going on the marketplace. However, I wouldn't be surprised if they went back on their word there. As for if there's going to be some other vehicles, I'd expect something Chinese to celebrate the Chinese tree. Probably not too high battle riding, but probably interesting. Probably something that should have been the original tree, but they, I don't know, wanted to try to sell it on the marketplace. You know, I'd really love to see as an event helicopter is the FA-223, which was a Second World War era. I don't think it counts as a helicopter, but 
it was a helicopter, basically, uh, for the Germans. And it was armed with a machine gun and could carry bombs or depth charges. It would be hilarious to see it flying around at low tiers. It wouldn't be too much of a threat. It wouldn't, like, be very fast. It would be a very easy target. But it would just be great to see. I think I'll look into it a bit more on the actual Sunday video of this week. Remember, this is the prior week Sunday, not this one, even if it comes out Friday. <laughs> Last teeny bits of news. This is actually very old, but Mike Ten D did a data mine right before the first Dev Server 1.91 went up. And in that, he found engine K-50 sounds. The K-50 is a Russian helicopter, if you don't know. I've been hearing rumors of it here and there for quite some time now, and I would not be surprised too much if we did see it in-game. There's also some 3D models of missiles fully rendered and ready to go. Not just texture files, I'm talking the whole shebang is right there. For the 9K121, which is a air-launched ATGM that could be fired from the K-50, the Spike ER, which is a Israeli ATGM, and of course the Fire Flash for the Swift. So two of those we kind of already know what they'd be going towards, but the Spike ER is what really gets me thinking, as it seems to be able to be attached to anything that moves, whether it be an IFV, helicopter, pickup truck, and even some boat, and was used by, it looks like, a wide range of nations. So I guess I'll just ask you, what do you think the Spike ATGM is going to be going towards? Besides that, I think that's just about everything that I wanted to cover this week. Well, actually, there's a few things I didn't expect to be covering this week, but this video kind of was buffering for a while. Well, I'll put it that way. I want to once again give a big old thank you to the three members of my YouTube channel, Perk You Up, Waffly Joker 6, and The Royal Rat. If you'd like to be among them, you can join the channel as well with a button down below for $5 a month. You get to see the videos a bit earlier than everyone else, and you can use custom emojis while I'm streaming. But if you have any comments or concerns or questions about this weekly War Thunder Weekly News video, you can hit me up down below or on my Discord. If you liked the video, like, hit the like button. If you didn't like the video, don't hit the like button. If you want to see more, be sure to hit the subscribe button. I make these every week. Uh, I try to get them on Sunday. This one, it, it's been a long Sunday. I like to make random videos throughout the week. And I stream on Saturdays. I also stream on Twitch sometimes here and there. So be sure to follow me there. And hit the bell icon to be notified anytime I upload anything. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll have a great day. Today's bonus news I want to dedicate to PG Noob's mom. I don't know her, I don't know what she looks like, but I assume she's a nice lady.